Okay, it's good again to have another opportunity to put out another 30-minute program, and uh, fortunately, uh, people still think they go rather quickly, and I guess that's a good indication. But for those of you tuning in, maybe catching us for the first time, we are just an informal Bible study. We are not denominationally connected. We have no one underwriting us. I'm looking over the group, and I imagine we have all kinds of different denominations represented here even today. And uh, all our purpose and intent is, is to get people to study their own Bible. You may not always agree with me. You don't have to. You can certainly disagree with some of my approaches to Scripture and uh, still be a believer and still not be in danger of hellfire or anything like that. But uh, the reason I like to pass it on is because this book has become so thrilling to my own heart after I realized some of the things that I hadn't ever been taught, and that is God's dealing, especially with the nation of Israel, and then how when he turned to the Gentiles, we just have a whole different approach. And once you see that, then this book just gets so exciting, and it's so easy to comprehend. So anyway, that's all we're attempting to do. We, uh, as I said in the last program, we don't attempt to make any profit from anything we do. The Lord has seen fit so far to supply all our needs, and uh, we're branching out. We just started on a Columbus, Ohio station last Sunday, and uh, we trust that by God's grace, as more opportunities present themselves, we'll be reaching out to more and more people. We again like to always remind our listeners how much we appreciate your letters, your phone calls. In fact, I had the question come up the other day, and I'm, I'm going to answer it on the program because I know a lot of people wonder. A gentleman asked me, he said, now when I send this letter to Les Feldick Ministries, and uh, if I enclose the check, he said, do you see the letter that I write? Or does it just go to some secretary? Oh, that's a good question, and I'm glad people ask it. I personally open every single letter that comes, personally. And I read every letter that comes, personally. And uh, then after we have collected the, the checks for several days, then I take them up to our bookkeeper on Monday night, who is in our Tahlequah class, and we just hand the checks to her then. But yes, I read every little note, and I thrill at every one of them. So. Don't ever uh, hesitate writing to us thinking that it will not get to me. It certainly does. All right, uh, again, we've got to remind you that the little books are available, the videotapes are available. You just call us on the 800 number or drop us a line, and we'll be more than happy to help you get them. And uh, again, we're so thrilled when people order several of these just for a Sunday school class, for a Bible study, and what have you. And again, we don't attempt to make anything on the books or on the tapes. Uh, if we can just cover our costs, that's all we're hoping to do. All right, now then, I guess we're ready to get right back in where we left off, and we only got past really one word in chapter 8, verse 1, and that was therefore. And uh, I just told the people while we're waiting, I guess I'm either long-winded or exhaustive, one or the other. But uh, anyway, we trust that we're being exhaustive because none of this can be just glossed over and taken lightly. And uh, this is the whole idea of Bible study, is to read carefully. So many people just read it, you know, well, I've read my Bible today. Well, that's not the way to do it. You, you read it carefully. In fact, whenever I answer a question that comes in the mail, I'll answer it with the Scripture, and I'll say, but now read it carefully. If you're just going to read it to be reading it, you're not going to get what I'm trying to tell you. And the same way with this whole chapter of, of Romans 8. We're going to take it slowly and carefully because, like I already said in the last program, this chapter is the gemstone of the book of Romans, and the book of Romans is the gemstone of the Bible. That's the way I like to look at it. All right, so now as you continue on in verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. Now you remember back in John's Gospel, what did Jesus say? He that hath the Son hath life. He who hath not the Son hath not life. And what is already resting on him? Condemnation, see? Condemnation rests upon every son of Adam. We're born sinners. And we never can forget that, that we are born into the Adamic race sinners. And that's what we've been looking at for these previous several 
chapters and these several months now of teaching in Romans that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are all sons of Adam. We are all sinners and under condemnation. But now the scripture says there is no condemnation. What a difference. Well, what made the difference? The gospel, see, the gospel. And uh, as I stated on the program several months ago, too often time I think evangelical Christians and our pastors and our evangelists and so forth, we have put cliches, remember I used the word? We have put cl cliches in place of the gospel. And you remember the one I used was probably most preeminent and is used the most is taking Jesus into your heart. How many times haven't we heard an evangelist or a preacher or whatever say, well, just come and take Jesus into your heart. And I said then, that's not the gospel. And then, lo and behold, Alice over here gave me a little book the other day. See, that's my library. When people give me books, I read them and get them back. I don't have a library. A lady one time walking out of the McAllister class said, oh, Les, I'd love to see your library. I said, Evelyn, I don't have a library. And she said, what? And I said, no, I don't have a library. I've got two or three books that I use a little bit, but other than that, no, I don't have a library. But people send me books, and uh, a gentleman from up here in northern Oklahoma sent me a whole box full the other day. Bless his heart, uh, I hope he's watching this program because I haven't had time to call him and tell him how much I appreciated these books, and uh, I haven't even finished them all yet. But anyway, uh, this condemnation, all mankind is under condemnation. But now, once we are in Christ, there is no condemnation. That's what the book says. I didn't dream it up. The book says it. All right, so there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Now, we looked at that at the last program, and I think we covered that sufficiently. Now, I'll probably raise the ire of a few listeners with my next comment, and that is, the rest of this verse does not belong there. And somebody's going to scream, oh, you're taking away from the Word of God. No, I'm not, because I noticed a long time ago that it doesn't really fit. And then I read, and now I think some Bibles even have it in their margin, that these words, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, do not belong in verse 1, but they are where they belong down in verse 4. And they're down there, and they belong there. And you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, just analyze it for a minute. I'm always almost screaming at people that salvation is faith plus nothing. No human energy, no human merit, it's faith plus nothing. Now, if you leave these words in verse 1, what does that make me? Well, makes me a liar. Because what does the book say? If this is scripture, and it isn't. All the er earliest manuscripts do not have it. All the great Bible scholars will tell you the same thing. Why? There is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What does that tell you? How did you get in Christ Jesus according to that? By not walking in the flesh, but walking in the spirit. And listen, that is not what got us into the, into the body of Christ. See that? And so you just leave those words off as not apropos for verse 1. But now when we get down to verse 4, oh, hey, it's perfect. It's just exactly where they belong. And let's jump ahead. We'll come back to it later anyway. But jump ahead to verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who... Because of verse 3, that God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin to take care of old Adam, condemned old Adam in the flesh. All right, now then this becomes appropriate. That the righteousness of the law might be filled in us who, now because, like I said, of verse 3, now because of that we walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. You see the difference? See, and this is what we have to learn to do. You just analyze the scriptures in the light of what all of scripture teaches, and then you can see an error like this. How it's crept in, I don't think anybody really knows, but they all agree that it's an error, that this should not be in verse 1. And, of course, my major premise is that then it makes it sound like we got in Christ by virtue of our walking, and we did not. All right? 
Let's go on to verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, you remember when we were back, I think is in chapter 5, when we were looking at this word law, I said you have to always, according to the context, determine what law are we talking about. Sometimes the word law will be used as simply a fact of everyday living. In other words, we speak of the law of gravity. It's just a fact of our living every day that what is up is going to fall down. We speak of the law of buoyancy. And that is a law that no man can ever supersede. I shouldn't say supersede because that's what we do when we build ships. But no, no man can change the law of gravity. It's absolute. And the law of gravity, I remember it took me a long time to learn it, but I finally figured it out. The law of gravity is that if you can put something in the water that weighs less than the amount of water it pushes aside, it's going to float. It's a law. It's a fact of life. All right, now this word used here is in the same context. For the law, the very fact of our everyday life is that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me or set me free from another fact of life, another established fundamental absolute, which was that the law of sin and death was operating every day. See? The law of sin and death. Uh, it's just a fact of life that mankind is under the curse. Mankind is under the power and the control of the satanic powers. Now, do you need a verse for that? First Corinthians, maybe second. Just a second, I have to look. Second Corinthians, chapter 4. Second Corinthians... Chapter 4, right down at verse 3 and 4. And I want these two on the screen, fellas, if you possibly can. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And this is exactly what I just said out of Romans 8. Verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And that's the world outside of us going up and down their busy lifestyle. They're lost. All right, next verse, 4. In whom, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them who believe not. Now, you see how plain that is? He hasn't blinded the minds of those who haven't joined a church. He hasn't blinded the minds of those who don't read their Bible. It doesn't say that. He has blinded the minds of those that will not believe. That's simple. All right, read on. So he hath blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest, big word, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine in unto them. Now, that's what we are up against when we try to enlighten people. We try to bring them to that same joy of salvation that we enjoy, and it's just like water falling off the duck's back. Why? Because they're blinded by the powers of Satan. They see absolutely nothing to be gained, and so consequently they go on their way in total darkness. All right, come back to Romans chapter 8, if you will. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now what do you have? What do you have here? Well, two facts of life. The one is that God is able to come in and do an operation in our life that totally gives us a new outlook on life. It gives us hope for that eternity to come. It's a whole new ball game compared to the rest of the verse of being locked in to sin and death. Now, you remember the verse back in Romans chapter 6? We looked at it several weeks ago now. 
Come back and look at it again. Chapter 6, verse 23. Verse, I think, that most people, if they've had any Sunday school and Bible school experience at all, daily vacation I'm talking about, have memorized this verse. I hope you have. But Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages... Now remember, wages are what you earn. For the wages of sin is death. You see how they're connected? Sin and death. For the wages of sin is death, but the other side of the coin is the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that a perfect comparison for what we see here in Romans 8? That the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus, that fact of life that we can experience seven days a week, totally sets us apart from that other fact of life, which sin and death, sin and death. It's an everyday experience for the whole world that they're living in the midst of sin and death, sin and death. The two are so tied together. And remember, where did it all begin? When Adam ate. And just as soon as he ate, what happened? He sinned. And the minute he sinned, what came, Romans 5 says? Death. So sin and death have been tied together ever since Adam took that first bite. And there's only one remedy for it, and that is the gospel, see? The gospel that Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. Oh, I just, my thoughts just came back. I, I was on the cliches a little while ago. And I suppose you all wondered what happened. Well, I lost my train of thought. When the cliches are used, such as, well, just take Jesus into your life, what are they, what are they circumventing? The gospel, see? In fact, I was, I was thinking back the other day. When I was a kid, and I imagine most of you older people, you're going to nod your heads in agreement. And not that it was all wrong, but I think it was totally overdone. And all we heard Sunday after Sunday after Sunday was hell, fire, and brimstone. Yeah, see, I knew I'd have heads bowing. Hell, fire, and brimstone. That's all they preached. Scared the socks off of people. And I've had so many of those come into my classes who got turned off by it, and they said, we don't want anything to do with it. If that's all that Christianity is, is hellfire and brimstone, I don't need it. Thank you. Now, that is true. Lost people are headed to a devil's hell. Now, don't ever accuse me of not teaching that. But that is not the gospel. Hellfire and brimstone preaching is not the gospel. Telling folk to come forward and take Jesus into your life is not the gospel. You hear me? The gospel is Christ died for you, was buried, and rose from the dead. Then when you believe the gospel, who are you taking into your life? Jesus Christ. Absolutely you do. He becomes your personal Savior. Absolutely he does. But when you use those little cliches by themselves, it's not the gospel, see? All right, now the same way back here in this verse again. I've recapped my thought. Here we have the law of sin and death. And that's been with man ever since Adam ate. But now to counteract that, to supersede that, what do we have? The law of the spirit of life. Now, I guess I should make this point right here, since the word spirit is now used. And I didn't, and I should have. Do you realize in those first seven chapters of Romans, the Holy Spirit was only mentioned one time, and not in a really doctrinal sense? And now, you remember after Paul explained that dilemma in chapter 7, now we come into chapter 8, and the Holy Spirit is going to be mentioned 19 times? Nineteen times in just this one chapter, there is a direct reference to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that tell us? Well, I guess uh, one way I could reconstruct it in those first seven chapters, as I reviewed in the beginning of the last program, in those first seven chapters, Paul lays all the groundwork of how we ended up in sin and under condemnation and how Christ died that we might be justified from all that, we might be forgiven, 
And then he comes through chapter 7 with the dilemma of how can I overcome that old Adam? How can I keep it in defeat? Well, what's the answer? Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit. And it's that indwelling spirit now that becomes our law, if you want to put it that way. All right, let's read on. Verse 3, for what the law? Now, of course, you look at the context. Now what's he talking about? Well, he's not just talking about a fact of everyday life like the law of gravity and the law of sin and death. Now he's talking about the Mosaic law. See? The Ten Commandments. For what the law? What the Ten Commandments? Or if you want to take the whole sphere of Judaism, put that in there too, that's all right. Or the Mosaic. For what the law could not do. See, it was limited. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. I hope I can find the verse. Hebrews. Hebrews. I hope I can find it. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 and come down to verse 7. <coughs> Hebrews 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant, that is the covenant of law, the law of Moses, if that first covenant had been faultless, now stop. When you see the word, if it would have been, then what does it imply? That it was. See? It was faulty. It was not faultless, like we like to think. All right? So if that first covenant of law had been faultless, then there should be no place sought for the second. If it was perfect, no need for anything more. But it wasn't. Oh, it was perfect from God's uh, perspective, but not from mankind. See? Man couldn't keep it. All right, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand, and so forth. So what the Scripture is showing us then is that the Mosaic law from man's perspective was faulty. Man couldn't keep it. And as I've emphasized ever since I started this series back in Genesis, the law had no power to help mankind keep the law. You all aware of that? The law had absolutely no power to keep a man from stealing, committing adultery, and what have you. All it could do was condemn him. That's all. But you see, now as you come back to Romans chapter 8 again, if you will, now, you see, living under the law of the Spirit, oh, what's the big difference? Well, the Spirit indwells us, as we saw in our last program in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6. Don't you know that your body is the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? All right, so what does the Holy Spirit in actuality become? Our law. See? The Holy Spirit becomes our guideline for Christian living, not a set of rules and regulations but his influence, his power. Do you see the difference? And so what the law did was just sat there, as I've always said so often, in cold stone. Just in cold stone. There, there was nothing warm or cuddly about the law. It was severe. It condemned. And it did nothing to help that person keep it. But, oh, the indwelling Holy Spirit is warm. He is loving. He does embrace us. He does, if I may use the word, he does cuddle us. And as he does so, he gives us that desire, first and foremost, to live pleasing in God's sight. He takes away that desire to be a rebel and to be uh, obnoxious and wicked and all that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Not me, not you. It's the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So, what the law, verse 3 now again of Romans 8, so what the law could not do in that it was weak, it had no power. 
That's what he means. Not that it wasn't perfect. Oh, don't ever accuse me of saying that the Ten Commandments weren't perfect. Absolutely they were. But they were powerless. You know the illustration I think others have used, and you've heard it before, and I've used it before. The law was just like a mirror. You come in from an afternoon of working in your yard or whatever you may be doing on a hot summer day, and you're sweaty and grimy, and you look in the mirror, and all the mirror can do is show you what's wrong, what needs cleaning up. But see, the mirror is never going to reach out and clean you. It can't. It's helpless. It's weak, see? And that was the law. It was just the mirror that showed man his utter sinfulness, his helplessness, but the indwelling Holy Spirit, hey, that's something totally different, see? All right, back to verse 3. Only a minute left. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Oh, I've said it on the program. I've tell my classes night after night. You know, this is something that I still cannot comprehend except through the eyes of faith, how that the Creator, God himself, and remember, that's who Jesus Christ was. He was the Creator of Genesis 1-1. He is the one who spoke and the universe came into being. He's the one who spoke, and Adam came up out of the dust of the ground. All right. Jesus Christ is the likeness of sinful flesh, and for the sake of dealing with the old Adam, he condemned the old Adam and the flesh. That was his whole purpose of coming was to get right down at man's level, in man's frame of flesh, that he might condemn sin and the flesh. Thank you for watching